There may be no one over the past 50 years who has inspired more people to give themselves to work of justice and mercy as followers of Jesus than Dr. John Perkins. John was orphaned as a child when he lost his mother to starvation, and he faced extreme poverty throughout childhood. As an African American in the rural South, he knew the sting of racial injustice, including wrongful imprisonments and beatings. He also knew the prison of his own bitterness and hatred as a result. But as Dr. Perkins shares so powerfully, the gospel encountered in friendship and intentional discipleship with Christ-hearted friends, both white and black, totally changed the trajectory of his life. For more than a half century, he has not only inspired others, he has modeled the messy, redemptive work of pursuing justice and mercy in community. Now, at 87 years old, Dr. Perkins is a third grade dropout who has received more than a dozen honorary doctorates. And the Christian Community Development Association that he helped found has more than 1,000 local affiliates across the nation. Dr. Perkins has told me more than once recently that he feels he's near the end of his long race. But he is going to finish well, serving his Lord to the very last breath. Today we have the privilege of hearing at least a little of what has sustained this saint for a lifetime in the long, hard work of justice and mercy. Welcome to Justice and the Inner Life, presented by the Christian Alliance for Orphans, We'll explore what it takes to sustain a heart of justice and mercy over a lifetime. Here's your host, Jed Medifin. Dr. Perkins, it is a joy to be with you. I have been looking forward to this conversation. Well, it's good to be with you, brother, and it's just good to see you again and be in your presence. Yes, indeed. Well, Dr. Perkins, let's start right at the heart of things. You have persevered through so much across nearly nine decades. You've known success and struggle, injustice and reconciliation, so much good, so much pain. What has fed you through that? What has enabled you to persevere with both passion and grace intact when so many don't? Yeah, I don't want to be too theological and I don't want to be too oversimple. Uh, I, I think it's by the, um, the understanding of the grace of God and understanding a little bit of the call of God. And now as I look back during these almost, uh, 80, seven years, which would be in June, I can see it even clearer that the, that the pain was working together for my good. And so it's all of God's grace. It's, um, it's not my comfortableness he called me to. He called me to obedience as he lead us through the valley of the shadow of death and that sort of sense that he is there. I, I think that's, it's only though as you look back, uh, if you would have known what it was going to be, you wouldn't have went, went through it. That's the call of faith on those other people like Abraham. If they would have knew where they were going, they would have made a decision that they wouldn't go. And so as I look back at it, so the, the pain, I think, has, and even the pain I've been going through for the last few months is, is making me, I feel, more committed to these last days that he's calling me to sh- empty myself with this sense of holism, that this incarnation of truth, and this justice as a stewardship issue, and putting those virtues those divine virtues back in the gospel in terms of its initial presentation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. I love that, Dr. Perkins. You you see the gospel as something that changes us, all of life, both personally and socially. Can you g- give us a specific example, a way that the gospel impacts on that broad social level? Paul said you can't be a Christian and practice racism. You have turned away from the gospel. 
That's what he was writing to the Galatians for. He said, which is not a gospel, a gospel that don't burn through racial barriers, a gospel that don't have reconciliation as its end is no gospel at all. We've been preaching that dichotomized gospel and allow racism and injustice to just boil over. I think there's a new generation that I see emerging on the scene and that we can see this gospel a little bit a bit clearer. What would you say to someone who's just starting out on this journey, you know, a young justice advocate, someone who really wants to live this out with, with all the hurt and the beauty that comes with that? What encouragement and challenges would, would you say to them? This is so important that you get these things right from the very start. I, I think getting this faith and grace, uh, getting the Abraham story, I think one of the greatest questions that I asked in the Bible in terms of discipleship, what did Abraham, our father, did find? He found the God behind the voice. He found the word of God. But he found the God that speaks. And John said he found the God that can be touched. He, he found the God of life. I heard him. We fell him. Uh, I laid my hand in his breath. Uh, get this faith thing right. That we live by faith and by grace. I, I, I don't, I think we still are doing too much salvation by works. And I think it, it robs us then of the joy and the thanksgiving. And I don't think David, I think he remembered what he did to his mighty man. He remembered his sin, but I think what he remembered about it and what he was so present with it, that God used him anyway, and he's still using him. So he's so grateful for the depths of redemption that he found in his life, you, 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 you know. And so I think we got to come back and, and, and trust this God, go out like Abraham not knowing where he was go- going. What does it look like? You you have mentioned that that some of the ju- justice activism you see today is is kind of a, a a salvation by works. It's it's trying to earn something rather than drawing life from from hope and faith and grace. D- describe the difference there. What what does it look like when justice is pursued as a means of works versus rooted in grace? It is allowing God to lead us that we somehow he give us the courage. He don't take the fear away, but he give us the confidence in himself. Uh, the just shall go on living by faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's pressing on. It's persevering. It's, 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 it's finding that passion and that concern for the broken. And we design to identify with the pain of the broken. Uh, it's walking with God. Uh, it's like the old song, walk with me, Lord, walk with me. While I'm on this tedious journey, I want Jesus. And that's the great assurance he gives us. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I think, boy, when I'm saying this now, uh, over the last few months, I've been going through a, a difficult time in terms of my own challenge. But I think I saw the redemption and the forgiveness of sin like I've never seen it before. I'm, I'm, I'm not, and, and, I, and I see that my, my sin was pretty grievous. Because I've been doing it so long, but I had a lapse of faith. And that God now is showing me the, the depth of he loved me and brought me through that dark place. And I love him more. So even even at 87 years old, you're still learning these lessons. I'm, I'm learning the forgiveness of sin. You can't get there without forgiving others. And it's mutual. White folk can't get there without us black folks, and us black folk can't get there without us white folk because we're going to keep some of that sin of 
of that we in us. Boy, we got to cough it up. How do you expect him to forgive me of my sin and I don't forgive some white person? And how does some white person think they're going to get by uh, without giving, forgiving some black? It, this is a, a, a neutral environment. This is a mutual environment, not a neutral, but a mutual environment that we got to forgive one another. Amen. Amen. And then the evidence of that, then I think other people will see it. I think other people will see that we are forgiving each other. And they will be drawn to join this pain with us. At first, they 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 feel the freedom of getting rid of some of this heavy load. You're carrying too much. I'm carrying my sin and your sin. I'm carrying my children's sin. Uh, There's a come a time that we got to point them to the sin bearer. So, Doctor Perkins, looking looking back over over all these years that you have persevered in this work, I, I imagine there have been many friends who um, were fellow advocates who are passionate about these things with you, but that that dropped out along the way. They they burned out. They they wearied out. What do you feel that they lacked, that they needed, that might have kept them at the work for a lifetime as you have? I I think it was discipleship. I think it was those people who gave their life to me, a little ignorant third grade dropout, when I was first came to faith. Uh, And I think that they buried with me. Uh, They discipled me. And they... That's that early planting. You know, they have a little child evangelism slogan for children. A child saved is a soul saved plus a life. And I took you talking about here. And I had some life because people anchored me in the word of God and the forgiveness of sin. And I'm still learning that. I think discipleship is a way to walk with God. And I think God calls us to make and to be involved in the discipleship. I think we see it in the ghetto. We see it in the neglect of the children. We see it as the young children becoming murderers. We see the jails filling up with that type of thing. And if we can go all that back to the lack of care, the lack of carefully teaching in the early age. I think that's what it called me to, uh, uh, to, to survive. It, it haven't been quite my goodness that I accumulated. It was the knowledge of God. This God who caused the light to shine out of darkness. This God has shined his light into our heart to give us the light of the knowledge of God. As we look in the face of Jesus Christ, that's looking in the face of each other and seeing the the dignity and the decent of humanity that we need to enter into that pain. And the best way to enter into that is through discipling people, bringing them to Jesus and discipling them. I think discipleship is where it's at, going to all the world and disciple the nation. And as quickly as you can get them into that discipleship. Paul said, that which you have heard of me among many nations, uh, uh, commit unto faith for men and women who shall be able to teach others also. And explain, explain, Dr. Perkins, the connection there between discipleship and work of justice and mercy in the world. You know, I think some people tend to separate those into def- different categories, right? And and they would see justice as, you know, you're out there and you're fighting racism, you're fighting hunger and disease and and but but discipleship that's kind of a a personal thing and it it may be well and good, but that is that's over in the separate category. But explain why you see these things as as totally connected. Well, God tells the first thing he tells us in the Bible that he is a creator and he tells us that humanity was created to know him so we can join with him in the management of creation and justice then becomes a stewardship issue it's how we steward the earth it's how we steward life 
How do we get the best out of life? I have come that you might have life and that you might have them more abundantly. God is concerned about the wholeness of life and our spirituality ought to make us more human. It ought to make us bear in the pain of an agony. I think that's why he put the cross there in his suffering and his blood as a sign of and the actually substance of our redemption in life. That means that we are in that pain and that pain that he demonstrated for us. And I think we could hear that old song. Must Jesus bear this cross alone of all the world's sin? No, he wants you and me to enter into that pain. True religion and under fire before God, the Father is this, to take care of the widows and the orphan, to engage ourselves with the pain and the suffering of this life here on earth. Yes, Dr. Perkins, yes, we have been loved at great cost, and God just calls us to go and do likewise to sacrificial love as a reflection of the way that God first loved us for the good, the healing, the thriving of others. And that that's the mission. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. The bill of uh, 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 Bob Pierce, let your heart be broke with the thing that break God's heart. That will give me the passion if God is concerned about the poor, why shouldn't I be concerned about the poor? If God has provided the resource of the world, why should I re- withhold those? Why should I say to my soul, be satisfied? Let's put it in the bond. He says, take it to the market so that the people can have food. Get, get, get some profit from it and use that to plant some more. Become a good thing. He's not telling us to be poor and to be lying. He said we've lost faith. We're over selfish. We're only concerned about our own self. So, so this is this is not this is not begging. This is not prosperity theology. This is obedience. This is living by faith. This is living by faith. Well, well, I'm having to learn some of that all over again right now. So don't don't put too much of it on my longevity. Yet my longevity would only be the grace of God that he allowed me to live this long. It, it, it has nothing much to do with my goodness because he's still having to help me to, to enter into that pain. Something I don't want to, I don't want to give up to enter into that pain. But, but at least I'm discovering the joy of it. It gives me a little energy. To press on now. Mm, amen. Dr. Perkins, if you were able to speak with yourself 50 or 60 years ago as you were at the front end of this journey, what, what encouragements and, and advice and counsel would you give yourself, um, of, from things that you have drawn over all those years? I, I, I think I, I would talk about the virtue of the church and the understanding of it. Uh, including the building, but not thinking that the building is the all exclusiveness of the church. I, I think I need for that collective people around us so we can hear the voice. I, I really think that God's burden, as I read the scripture, he always wants to speak to us in the congregation. But I think he wants to call out a people that would bear his name and that would be the church. I think it's our understanding of the church. Man, I love the church more than ever before. But my definition would be just a little bit bigger than the building. But I think it would be my understanding of our need for each other. I, I, you know, I, I think sin is my extreme individualism. I think sin is my extreme selfishness. I think sin is my not satisfied with being equal with each other and equal with God even. I think we really sort of want to be God. Hmm. Dr. Perkins, 
you know, one one thing that, that is clear is there there is an energy and enthusiasm for so many of the things that you have spoken about for so long, for justice and mercy, young people, even older people, people are, are passionate for those things. They want to be advocates for justice. They want to live it out. Do you see anything in that that uh, alongside the goodness and beauty of it that concerns you, areas where you would say, hey, folks, you need to be, as you pursue justice, you also need to be careful about these these parts of what you're doing. Yeah, I, yeah, I, and I think that's Bill, and I think that's what the um, the epistles was. The epistles was against heresy. Those things are going to blind your mind. Those things are going to pull you away. That's why those epistles was there. I have heard that this is what you're doing. You're over exalting Paul and Peter. I can, I can discern uh, the Galatian. You are behaving just like Peter behaved. You have so quickly turned away from the gospel because Peter treats the Jews different when they are here than he do the Gentiles uh, when they are gone. You can't be a Christian and a racist. You get the idea? I think it's, 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 it's the teaching of the Word of God. It's the disciple. That's what the epistle was. To me, the revolution for the Roman Empire was those epistles that Paul sent out back to those churches and those congregations. That was revolutionary going. Be careful. Be careful. Watch those people who would like to have too much authority. In the church, uh, it's 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 discipleship around the mission. The mission is to know God and to make Him known. The mission is a mission of sharing this central message of redemption. And so, the wholeness of God's concern for man is in the gospel. Is in that presentation of the good news. That brings the great joy. You know, I, I think it's that discipleship that we do within the church is so important. Dr. Perkins, you were saying earlier that it, it just that the church at any point can have certain blind spots. So that's what were the, the epistles were, that they were reminding people, hey, it sounds like you've got a blind spot here or there. Do you feel like the, the church today, and, and including those who really do care about justice, and yet we we have a particular blind spot or two that you would really encourage us to be watching out for. Uh, so so I, I I think that 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 uh, that sin is so evasive, and and I, and our and our culture is so corrupt, and our language is so bad. Hate is in it. So I think over pattern. I think we got to depend on the leadership of the Lord. I think Psalms 23 is perfect. That God makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. And when I get weak, he restores my soul. I, I think that we got to live more in the moment. This morning in my Bible class, I was asking whether my faith was like electric. You can't can it up and save it. It's fluent. It's fluent. It's alive. It's alive. And so you can't just depend on yesterday's faith. There is adequate for today. I think that's what how great thou art. Is calling that faith grace. Mm, yes. If the ocean was ink and the elements was, was a canvas, I wouldn't have enough ink and the canvas wouldn't be big enough to write the grace of God. Grace of God. So I, and, and that grace and faith, see, the, see, it's, it's, it's the, it's the grace that creates the faith and it becomes not of ourselves. It becomes the gift of God. Dr. Perkins, a while back we were having conversation about um, just what our souls need to nourish us, to persist in 
in work of justice and mercy, and you express that you love the Psalms. You were, you said, I remember you saying, I love the Psalms. What, what about the Psalms have you found so life giving over the years? I, I think I'm discovering it. I think it restored me. It was the agony. See, the, the Psalms was the pain and the agony. David, I, I see David. He's a person after God's own heart because I think David went for God's heart. And I think David went for God's heart that God would forgive him. He didn't take all of the consequences away. I mean, David's family was a mess in life. David had problems. But he, I think David was saying, if I never had a problem, I would know that God could solve them. You have a new book, Dream With Me. What do you especially hope readers will get from it? You know, I was reading myself, Dream With Me, and I've been reading it over and over. I'm really concluding in what I'm getting from it, really, is the freshness and the ongoing of my confession of sin and that God loved me despite myself. I think that's what I'm getting and I'm praying that the people who read it will see that as it, because that's what he came into the world for. You know, all the other good things are wonderful. It tells my own pilgrimage. You have a pilgrimage and you need to tell your pilgrimage to other, others. But boy, what, what I'm getting at in the net is that if I don't confess my sin, I got them. If I dislike you, it almost turned to malice in me. And then you become my problem instead of my problem. I take it to the Lord in prayer. Mm. I take my problem to the Lord in prayer. That's what I'm getting from it. It sounds like what you've said in many different ways over and again in this conversation is that that in some mysterious way, God's grace in our lives, in our hearts, our experience of that grace is the wellspring of all our work in life, all our justice, all the mercy that might God might be able to spill from our lives. It is all rooted in his grace in our hearts and lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. This is what I'm getting at this crucial moment in my life, what I really want to do is to take my struggles, my pain, God's grace, and share that with this leadership. I have given up on successors. So when I go now to speak, I'm saying, you are the the object of my love. You are finishing well with me. I pray that you will take this whole gospel that we have brought forth. Even this whole idea of justice, maybe we have made it a little clearer. Will y'all carry this to the world? Will y'all carry this to the world? Will y'all join a church? Would y'all be part of a collective group? Could you pool your resources to carry the urgency of this good message of redemption to our generation, to our generation. That's what I want to do with the rest. I'm, I'm trying to get the courage to do it. And in the end, Dr. Perkins, what, what would you most want people to say about your life? I, I like it as a slow end, so I heard it in Thurgood Marshall. Uh, that's the first black Supreme Court justice. Yes who fought so hard for our justice uh, as black. He said, I did what I could with what I had. I think of that first, I think about it in terms of me being a third grade dropout. But I also think of it in terms of, well, my mother died and I lived and she died of starvation. I think of that as a stewardship of life. And and so I wish that people would say I done what I could with what I had. 
He gave me the Holy Spirit. He gave me a disciple to disciple me. He gave me a church. He gave me a wife that loved me. He gave me eight children. So I, I think it's a lot. I think he gave me a lot. Amen. And Dr. Perkins, you have indeed been faithful to those things. I know for me and, and so many others that you have taken those gifts that God gave you and poured good gifts into our lives that, that God has used and continues to use. And we are very, very grateful both to the Lord and to you for those gifts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for spending this time with me, Dr. Perkins. really is a, a gift to me and will be to many others as well, I think. Great, great. Great. I think friendship is the is the greatest human to human gift that God can give to human beings. The gift of friendship. What a privilege to have this conversation with Dr. Perkins. You know, just about everything today feels transitory. Even many justice causes seem to rise and fade like pop culture trends. But Dr. Perkins' life shows us that the true work of justice and mercy is never just a trend or a fad. It is and always must be a long obedience in the same direction. And that kind of perseverance isn't sustained by enthusiasm alone. As Dr. Perkins described, it must be lived out in community, in the church, despite all her flaws. It is cultivated by the intentional discipleship of brothers and sisters who are a bit further down the road. And most of all, as Dr. Perkins reminded again and again, our perseverance flows from God's grace. Perseverance, like all the fruit of the Spirit, springs from a heart that knows the love and forgiveness and goodness of our Heavenly Father intimately, as Dr. Perkins so clearly does. If you'd like to get to know Dr. Perkins better, his most recent book is Dream With Me. I'd also recommend his book, Let Justice Roll Down. And of course, if you'd like to hear other Justice and the Inner Life podcasts, visit us at www.kfo.org forward slash inner life. You've been listening to Justice and the Inner Life with Jed Menefit, a production of the Christian Alliance for Orphans. To learn more about the Alliance, visit kfo.org.